Hello, everybody. Sorry. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, some of my research uh, with hellbenders, which are uh, referred to in North America as giant salamanders. Uh, but before we get into hellbenders, um, I'd like to talk first about whole balance evolution. So the ability to characterize multiple microbiomes uh, has uh, allowed us to basically change our perspectives on multicellular organism evolution. And it mostly comes from the fact that uh, there is now a shift in uh, looking at uh, the evolution of multicellular organisms from the host being the unit of selection to the host in the symbiont being the unit of selection or the whole part. This comes from uh, the fact that multicellular organisms possess abundant and diverse microbial communities. Also, the microbiome is transmitted between parents and offspring with high fidelity. And the fact that the microbiome uh, provides some um, fitness uh, benefits to its host. So, for, uh, sorry, uh, studies have found that there is uh, very, uh, a lot of um, host specificity in the microbial communities. And for example, let's move this out of the way. Here we see a phylogenetic tree of uh, different bat families compared to a cluster tree of microbial dissimilarities in the gut microbiota of the same uh, bat families. And you can see, sorry, there is high um, degree of convergence between the two trees of the microbiota and of the phylogenetics, showing that there's species uh, specificity in the microbial communities. This is important for me as a herpetologist. Um, Kidrick fungus is a uh, pathogen that has devastated many of the uh, species. And um, it is a pathogen that attacks the skin. So you see that uh, many species, uh, uh, sorry, it has caused a lot of degradation in many species. And however, some species have really more better resistance than others to the pathogen. And it is believed that the skin microbiota might confer some protection. Kinnaman et al. did a study on four different amphibian species across California and multiple sites, and they were able to see that there was high uh, species specificity in the microbiota. So here we see our principal core analysis plot, where each point corresponds to a microbial community from an individual, and the different colors are basically the different species uh, designations for that host. And you can see that the microbiota is clustering based on that species identity, even though you know they were collected from different sites. So now to get to the halbenders. I study halbenders, which are North America's giant salamanders. There are two subspecies of halbenders, the Osart subspecies and the Eastern subspecies. Both subspecies are found in Missouri, but they're not sympatric. And both subspecies are endangered within the state. The Osart halbender being federally endangered as well. In a previous study that I performed uh, for my first chapter in my PhD, I saw that subspecies identity could be a driver of uh, the microbiotic structure of these salamanders. Just to tell you a little bit more about hellbenders before we move on, um, here's a uh, population genetic study that was done on hellbenders in Missouri. And one of the things that they were able to find is that within, uh, within both subspecies, you have the population structure um, going on between the western and eastern rivers in their range within the state. At the same time, uh, Missouri is working really hard uh, conserving the species. Uh, within within the state, and they have a captive breeding program and captive rearing program going on at the St. Louis Zoo, where they collect eggs from the wild or collect eggs from individuals that they have in these artificial rivers, and are able to rear them and you know and return them to to the wild, hopefully to supplement those populations that are declining. So, what are the objectives of my study? So, I'm really interested in finding you know, and characterizing the microbiota of albinos in Missouri. Missouri is a perfect state to do this because the two subspecies are found in very close proximity. And just trying to assess what is the level of, uh, at which differentiation microbiota happens, with, whether it happens at the different genetics of populations, where it happens at the subspecies level, and also we're interested in seeing what are the differences between captive and wild individuals. So here's my sampling regime. Uh, pay attention to the colors that I show you in this slide because I will be using them throughout my presentation. So for the eastern hellbenders, we collected um, individuals from the Niagara subpopulation in the Niagara River, that's the, the western part. And then also from the um, Big Piney and Gascony River for the eastern, uh, or for the other um, genetics of population. And for the Ozark subspecies, we collected individuals from the North Fork of the White River being the western, and the uh, Current River and the Eleven Point River being the eastern uh, sub genetics of population that was identified by the covers. We were also had the opportunity to work with the St. Louis Zoo and sample some of their captive individuals. This is actually an individual from Purdue University, not the, the St. Louis Zoo. But they're really cute, so 
Um, so we collected 10 individuals from the East and Northern Juveniles that they have at the zoo, and also 10 individuals from the OSAR Juveniles. Um, the zoo was really interesting, interested in knowing if there were differences between the individuals that they hold in the aquariums, you know, in the, in the, in the back seats of the zoo, or in the display individuals uh, that are you know, on display for people to, to see. So we, we were able to collect from, from both just to see if there were differences. Um, then we did some uh, microbiota um, methods where we uh, did 16S RNA sequencing. So we applied a 16S RNA marker, which is a marker that we use to identify uh, bacteria. We did some mice sequencing and processed our bees using Chime, which is a, a well-known um, uh, microbiota processing uh, software, to do our OTU clustering at 97% identity, which is uh, species similarity uh, between the bees, uh, taxonomic assignments, and phylogenetic relationships between those uh, OTUs. Then we did some um, diversity analysis where we characterized the, the alpha diversity, which is a, you know, the diversity within each, each sample, the beta diversity, and we used a unweighted unit measure, which is basically a phylogenetic uh, way of comparing communities um, sorry, based on the phylogenetics of the OTUs present, and it's, it's basically presence absence based. And then we took the OTUs and input put those into a program called PyPress. And what PyPress does is that it compares the OTU sequences to known genome sequences of bacteria, and it's able to give us a prediction of what metabolites each OTU is producing. So for the comparison with, within each subspecies, we used a verified OTU table. So basically what we do is we standardize the number of reads that we're comparing between uh, individuals so that they're all the same. And we tested between the two subpopulations. And uh, I'm going to show you the results in the PCOA, which is the principal coordinate plot, similar to what I showed you before in that uh, human study with the different amphibians in California. And then we also did an analysis statistic, which is basically a way of measuring the variation between groups and comparing that to the variation within each group. So you can see here that for the eastern hellbenders, so I will show you my methods and results as we go through. Uh, for the eastern hellbenders, we see that there are barely marginal differences, so they are clustering separately, but the variation that is going on between the two subpopulations is not very big. And the anosin shows that the, the, the difference is very small, so the R value for the anosin goes from 0 to 1, 0 being, being very similar, 1 being very different. So that's uh, you know, different from the R's that we're used to. So the, the difference is very small, and then it's barely not significant. I, I think that if we got some more samples, we could you know, pick up a difference, a significant difference between these two. The same pattern goes for the OSAR calendar. So when we compare the two subpopulations, we see that there is some clustering, separate clustering, but at the same time, that, that statistic is not you know, strong and, and significant. So now we wanted to see what are the differences between the two subspecies. So for that, we calculated or we derived a 50% core of the using. What that means is that we were only interested in ubiquitous OTUs. You want to use present, you know, on all or most um, individuals within each subspecies. So, um, so we calculated the 50% uh, core OTU table and then compared those four OTU tables to each other. And again, did similar uh, statistics uh, analyses to what I just showed. So here you see the results for the two subspecies. You can see that there is great variation or great differences uh, between the two uh, subspecies, the Easterns and the Ozark Calvinders, and I colored them in their sub genetics and population so that you can see that you know there is not a lot of uh, variation between the, the subpopulations within each subspecies because we're using that 50% core OTU table. And again, the, that analysis statistic is a 0.63 R value and it's uh, significant. I did a clustering tree, very similar to what I showed you with the bats. And you can see that the, and this is based on the microbial differences, uh, that unweighted unifrac. And you can see that the two subspecies cluster separately. And then within each subspecies, you can see that there's not a lot of separation going on between the two genetics of populations. We would expect that using a 50% core of the table. OK, so now we're going to compare the captive versus wild. So we obviously did a uh, comparison of the microbiota. And we used the verified OTU table for that. Uh, just testing the difference between the captives in the wild, with the PCOA and the anosin. But again, remember that I told you that uh, for all our OTUs, we calculated or, or derived uh, potential um, metabolites. So we also did some very uh, similar multivariate statistics based on the presence and absence of those metabolites. So here's the microbiota differences uh, again. So you can see that there is clear differentiation or clustering you know, of the captive versus wild differences. 
And that I know some statistics, again, is pretty high, and the uh, significance. And the same goes for the um, OSAC health centers. And remember that for the OSAC health centers, we sampled individuals from the aquaria and individuals from uh, the display. And you can see that even though they're you know, different uh, places that we collect them from, those uh, microbiota communities are still differentiating, and that I know some statistics. Now looking at the metabolite differences, again, these are just predicted metabolites. We can still see that there are different predicted metabolites for the two uh, groups, the captive versus wild, for both the Easterns and the Ozark, and that difference is significant. So just to recap, because I just threw you know, a bunch of results uh, to you, between the genetics of populations, we saw marginal differences in the microbial communities for, for both of species. Uh, between the, the subspecies, we saw that there are differences between them, at least in the core microbiome. And then between wild and captive individuals, we know that there are both differences in the core microbiome and the microbial communities, and also in those predicted metabolites that we derive from phycos. So what does this mean for health vendors? Well, knowing that there are microbiome differences between the two subspecies is important because it's a lot, it, it gives us a clue on how we are going to manage this species in Missouri. Um, there is a lot of debate whether OSAC and Eastern Calvinists are different species, so kind of finding that their microbial symbionts are very different adds support to the idea that these might actually be at the species level differentiation. For captive versus wild individuals, you know, we know that captivity distorts that natural microbiota acquisition, and that could have an impact on reintroduction success of these animals when we start placing, you know, supplementing populations. It could affect the way that they resist diseases, and it should change the way, or at least give us an idea of what things that we can change, you know, going from uh, hatchlings to larvae to when we reintroduce individuals in the wild. So before I finish my talk, I'd like to touch back on the whole arms evolution slide that I had at the beginning and just reinforce the fact that it is important to consider the way that symbionts affect the fitness of the host, specifically when we are trying to manage a, um, a species that is uh, endangered and possibly uh, vulnerable to these. With that, I would like to thank my sponsors. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take Yeah, so previous studies have shown that, um, um, you know, captive invaders are far microbiota from other animals in the zoo and from the people rearing them. Uh, and we're actually working at Purdue on ways to uh, introduce environmental bacteria to kind of assimilate them into what they will be facing in the wild. Yes. So, um, anyway, I, I can't remember the name of the So, the northern volume, the eastern volume, Thank you, everybody.